Hello, getting ready for the second session. In about three minutes we'll start. Uh, can you hear me and see me okay? Thank you. I may have created a poll here. I'm just curious, the different attendees, what's your field of research? I put a few options. Hopefully, I didn't miss anything key. Just to get an idea, hey, can you see that poll? It may be under polls, which is next to ask a question. So, oh, good. Hey, from. Hmm. Okay. So again, yeah. I can't hear anything. We're alive, by the way. Can you hear me? I think you can't hear me. All right, so we have a few engineers, a few people from clinical, neuroscience a lot. Okay, that's good. It gives some idea of, uh, you know, who are we talking to? I think the level of talk obviously is uh, good for all, but uh, definitely nice to get that information. Right, I think we will start <clears throat> now. We'll look at the poll a bit later again. 
damit. Yeah, so we have a diverse crowd. Uh, if there is a category I forgot, then feel free to put. So, you know, but uh, good. All right. So I will start the presentation. Good. So, welcome to session two. Uh, Frank. I don't know if you can, you know, let me just check for a sec because you're my backup here. Can you hear me right now or still no? Okay, you'll figure it out, but hopefully everyone can so we can start. All right, let's go for it. So, welcome to session two. Uh, we'll talk about how we use the computational models to simulate uh, EEG from the circuits and the relevance to mental health. So, again, we start with a certain mechanism and the first session showed us uh, about our ability to infer the effect of changes in uh, disorders in cellular and circuit mechanisms onto activity and function. But uh, what is also very important is to look at the effect on clinically relevant signals like EEG to see if there are biomarkers of those changes. Um, so that will be the talk uh, in this session. So to give you an example where uh, previous studies uh, that measured EEG, recorded EEG, EEG in patients and control, um, showed an increased power of uh, EEG. So power essentially is quantified by this thing called power spectral density that quantifies the different uh, power of the oscillation frequencies in the EEG signal. And in the bold curve here you see the control and the lighter curve is uh, depression and you can see an increase in the low frequencies the middle uh, frequencies we'll get into details uh, later about this but that's an example of changes in EEG that can be used as biomarkers and uh, the nice thing about EEG it's cost effective and it has a good temporal resolution so if you can compare it to fMRI, let's say fMRI has a 3D information about the brain in different voxels, but temporally it's usually on the order of seconds, and EEG it's on the order of milliseconds, and that has a lot of important information when you read out brain activity. This study specifically also looked at early depression. That's where they saw those changes uh, of patients. So that's also uh, worth noting about it. So once we have the circuits, we can try to get some simulated EEG to try to do the same things, really compare control and compare to a condition and then see what happens. I will just pause one second to see that I'm not talking to myself. Thumbs up that you can hear me. Dan sent a message, I'm not sure when, but please just a double check now and then I'll continue. Thumbs up from anyone if the voice is good. Excellent, thank you. Alrighty. So, um, because the microcircuit models that we generate are detailed, so they have the full morphology, the different compartments, the electrical currents that flow inside, 
They also, we can estimate the electrical potentials outside in a volume. So we implement the models in a software called LFPi. There are other softwares that can do the same thing, but LFPi um, has a lot of advantages and uh, we fully recommend it. Um, you, we distribute the cells in a volume that has the right dimensions of human layer to three. That's about one millimeter depth. And we look at the column of uh, a few hundreds of micrometers uh, radius, uh, more like 500 micrometers. And we can stick electrodes in silico and record potentials. Now, a very important thing to note Whereas certain kind of models are actually complicated, the model of the potential that you see uh, either in the layer or even outside is fairly straightforward. I mean, the um, equations and the theory are very well understood. There is a decay with distance. There are certain media of the brain that affect the decay and distort certain frequencies. But uh, I, I would say that this component of the modeling is actually fairly well understood. So once you have a circuit that is firing, um, adding electrodes to it is fairly straightforward, sorry. And then we can record not just the spikes that you see here in the familiar raster from the circuit, you can see LFP, local field potentials from electrodes within the layer, and also EG from outside the head, and I'll explain how we estimate that, all right? Those are simulated, obviously. And just to mention, this work uh, was primarily done by Frank. Uh, uh, it's not yet published in its preparation. Um, uh, just to let you know, and Frank in the tutorial will get more into the details of some of the code and how we do certain things. So how do we calculate EEG? Um, in LFPi, and that's actually, in general, any potentials outside the cell. So uh, there are multiple compartments. Each one of it reproduces a certain potential outside the cell. So there are two options. Either you just sum it all and decaying each one by distance from where your electrode is uh, to what the, what the source is, right? But they showed also that when you want to estimate EG, uh, when you're far away from the circuit, uh, even a dipole, a single dipole is a good approximation of the uh, signal that is relevant to EG from cells in the circuit. So that's worth noting. Uh, that paper has um, more details about some of those calculations and the tool. This tool is open. It's uh, pretty much Python based. Uh, so, yeah, I really recommend it. It doesn't require you to use necessarily detailed morphologies. That group actually adapted some of my older models into simpler, smaller, compart fewer compartments. Uh, and that is pretty good to estimate signals as well. So if you have any interest to model EEG, you don't necessarily have to have very heavy models, and uh, but you can. Uh, Either way, you really plug the models in and Frank will show you some of the details and you can estimate the clinically relevant EEG signals. Actually, I'll also mention, this is a forward calculation. Some of you that do EEG may know that there is, as an experiment, usually experimenter, you have the EEG because you recorded it, and to understand the underlying networks or mechanisms, you usually work backwards. You use the inverse solution to estimate sources. Well, there is an improvement in the ability to do this. This is a very ill-posed um, problem, going from EEG to actually sources in the brain, because there are pretty much infinite sources that could account for what you see. So it's worth noting that working forward has the advantage that you know your circuit and, and then you get one solution of the EEG and the link is fairly simple in that sense. Obviously the advantage of going inverse wise is that you start from your data, right? But what people have showed as well, and I'll show it uh, later, is that you can fit your data 
using the forward simulation so that you can still work in a very data-driven manner while not doing the inverse, but doing the forward. So I think that's very important and maybe useful to some of you. Another thing to note is that, uh, so as I said, it's fairly simple to get the potentials from all those uh, multi-compartmental cylindrical dendrites, <coughs> uh, but also then there is a simple model of uh, four spheres that represent the different relevant media. There is the brain, there is the CSF, the skull and the scalp. Each one has a different distortion properties. Obviously this uh, skull is one of the main sources of distortion when it comes to EEG. MEG doesn't have this problem. But EEG, there is a filtering done by the skull, but uh, LFPi takes this into account where it uh, gives you the simulated EEG from your circuit. So that is in that software as well. You can, by the way, also record ECOG or LFP if it's more relevant to your experiments. ECOG is right under the skull. Uh, it circumvents some of the distortion uh, that is happening, but obviously most experiments, especially in the clinic, are EEG rather than ECOG. So that's in a nutshell how the software works. And then we can simulate EEG from the circuit and we can do our own PSD from the simulated EEG. So this is a, an example from our circuit. As you can see, sorry, you have the different power of different frequencies, frequencies on the x-axis, uh, power on the y-axis. And nicely enough, by having well-constrained models in terms of electrical properties, synapses, connectivity, firing rates, the circuit on its own oscillates in frequencies that you see at resting state in uh, humans, in vivo. Eyes closed, specifically. That will be uh, picking the alpha frequency, which is 8 to 10 hertz, uh, sorry, 8 to 12 hertz. And also some uh, theta power, <clears throat> 4 to 8 hertz. Uh, and also, uh, if you look at the log scale, there is a 1 over f relationship here between the log frequency and the power, which is also something you see. And there are nice papers that relate the slope of that to state of consciousness, like sleep, slow, slow wave sleep, and, and other things. So that's, those are relevant measures that it's are key when you want to reproduce your healthy control resting state, e.g. simulations, and nicely enough, they emerged from the well-constrained circuit. So that was a nice validation for the circuit. And to give you an example of what, do, what are those oscillations, really, uh, if you look across time here on the x-axis, and the frequency is the y-axis, and the colors are the power of each frequency, then you can see that at this time there was a theta event uh, and also an alpha event, right? Here there is more of a theta event, here are some more alpha. So it's important to note it's not an ongoing oscillation in like a certain frequency non-stop. It's more of events that are a few hundreds of milliseconds that have a certain pattern that matches the frequency. And that is also exactly what you see in humans as well, EEG. So just, I'm not going to get into it, but I think that's an important point when you want to understand what oscillations are to sort of disconnect your mind from that sine wave interpretation. It's more of events. It's a certain kind of events, but there is a tendency when you look over time to see a lot of those events. So you would say there is an, an alpha 10 hertz kind of uh, events happening roughly at that frequency. So we've seen comparison of depression microcircuit models and healthy ones in terms of brain activity, brain function as well, how we interpret it. But it's nice also to see, okay, how does the 
baseline, because we are simulating just really spontaneous baseline activity that is like resting AG, how does that compare between the two microcircuit models? So we took our depression model and we computed the PSD, the power spectral density from that as well in purple, and compared it to the healthy microcircuit model PSD. And what we see is an increase in power in depression and um, essentially you see it all across right frequencies now an important question here is essentially how much of it is just broadband increase across all frequency and how much of it is more specific rhythmic increase in, in particular bands and for that we can break the uh, PSD into components and there is a Python toolbox that does it. Frank will talk about it in the tutorial. So we can first get the broadband change, which is essentially, I'll just quickly mention, it's fitting a one over F here and just seeing what the difference is. So that is the broadband change, as you can see, an increase in all frequencies that are relevant to the resting stage. And then after we subtract this from the PSD, we can essentially see the more specific rhythmic changes. And interestingly, the increase you see, it's more rhythmic in the theta, 4 to, to 8 hertz frequency, than, and not so much in the alpha one and a little bit in the beta as well. So that's um, this together with the absolute change can be used as biomarkers of reduced SST inhibition. Because essentially, <clears throat> at least predict, we make the prediction that when you reduce the SST in a realistic model and you simulate the EEG, that's the changes you expect to see. Obviously there are uh, quite a few aspects to being able to fully interpret that. Uh, I think I can mention them now, actually. Um, for example, if you change PV inhibition, what would you see? Would the things overlap? How specific it is to an SST change? All of this is actually remaining to be further investigated, but at least this is already offer you a candidate link. If you see a change in theta, not so much as change in alpha rhythmically, it could be that that type of depression is more a result of reduced SST. Uh, and then further ex simulations can maybe probe other candidate mechanisms and compare and try to dissociate the different type of changes to better classify and categorize and stratify uh, the cases. So another thing that we do, it's a bit less relevant, I think, clinically, but more in terms of the neuroscience and the mechanistic understanding, is to look at uh, the spiking in the different cell types in relation to the phase. Here I'll show you just the pyramidal neurons. Um, but essentially, if you take the EEG, the original is in the light gray and the black is the band pass filtered in the theta and alpha frequencies, which we saw are relevant for both the resting state healthy, but also the changes in depression. We can try to see when do the spikes of the pyramidal neurons tend to occur in relation to those uh, uh, EG signal. And for that, what we usually do is we extract the phase using the Hilbert transform envelope of the signal. And then we just count the spikes. When do they happen in relation to the phase, right? And then we do a phase plot. And what's nice, if you look at the black, that's the healthy microcircuit spiking. There is a very clear preference close to the end of the cycle, the trough would be zero. Close to the trough, right before uh, the trough, there is a lot of uh, spiking happening and you can really visibly see it here. You look at all those fairly synchronized pyramidal neuronal spiking, they happen close to that uh, 
uh, sorry, let's give you a better example here, right? So that can really help you understand the underlying circuit spiking dynamics in relation to the EGUC, how that can inform or help you with understanding things. That's the next stage, but at least the first stage is this. And you can compare it to depression in the purple here. And what we usually see is a certain broadening of that uh, preference. It's not huge, but there is a significant change. And overall, when you think about it, there is reduced SSD, pyramidals are firing more. What we're able to see here, sorry, is that that firing is less specific. It's a bit more noisy, so spikes occur in more all over the place rather than a specific uh, preference. Again, it's not a huge change, but that's how you interpret that change, right? There is slight uh, in, uh, increase in that specificity. And yeah, that can really help you understand also the link between signal changes, because we saw a change in the power of the PSD to also changes in the neuronal coding and activity. Another thing that is nice in this kind of modeling is that you can take your dipole that you simulated and then you can plug it into a more realistic head model. For example, in M&E, uh, we plug the um, dipole into the um, prefrontal cortex. Uh, and then essentially we can estimate the EEG better taking into account the head curvature and skull shape and all of that, right? So that is fairly straightforward. I mean, you run your very detailed simulations, you get the dipole uh, files, and then you can just plug plug them and do other things that you would do um, even just with EEG processing. So for example, what we're able to show uh, using this is that the signal that we get from the microcircuit, this is a topo plot, how they call it. You have the different EEG sensors here in little dots. And the circuit is somewhere around here. And then you see the power of the EEG signal. And noise would be about that, you know, when you... Uh, noise level would be somewhere around here in terms of the, where the color gets to. And you can see that the signal from the circuit is very local. So that helps you understand signals that you see in a certain location, how they affect the other location, just the signal themselves. You know, I mean, I get that question sometimes that people say, okay, but different regions connect to other regions and affect them. That's true. That's on top of it. But at least in terms of the signal, it really helps you to better understand because signals do propagate. There is, it's not like a point. Uh, in terms of the effect, it's more of a few millimeters. So it really delineates the um, spatial relevance to help you interpret what you see. And this is an example, we can take the PSD power in depression minus healthy and see those differences, how far can we see them? That's another thing we can do with this data. And it's worth noting the spread is asymmetric both of the signal and this, uh, exactly because the brain is not symmetric. There is curvature, it's a bit different, you know, laterally and frontally. Uh, so that is exactly where taking the detailed um, signal simulations into a head, realistic head model can make more relevant and accurate predictions to the clinic. All right, so that's more or less for depression examples. I want to give you a few examples of how we also can use this in schizophrenia. And I think Andrea might talk a little bit more on that, but regardless, um, a couple of slides from the circuit perspective. So in schizophrenia, one of the uh, very useful tasks that is associated with EEG biomarkers is the oddball processing auditory oddball. So you can present uh, people with uh, tones of a certain, a sound of a certain tone and then a deviant tone. So you have the standard in black and the deviant in red. The deviant occurs less frequently. It's more of a surprising event. And 
what you see in the EEG in healthy uh, is that the early response, the first hundred or so milliseconds, it's about the same. There isn't a difference when you present the standard or the, or the deviant. But uh, further in time, uh, roughly between 100 or 200, it can be 150, 170, but roughly around that window, you see a, a mismatch in the signal between the standard and deviant, and it's called mismatch negativity. And importantly, in schiz uh, patients with uh, schizophrenia, the mismatch negativity is reduced. And that's a very solid bio biomarker that has been characterized. And he, the changes you see are in areas like the prefrontal cortex, where this processing of deviation and surprise and prediction is happening. And Andrea will have a lot more to say about it. Uh, so, yeah. Stay tuned for that. Uh, but for us, um, this is another example where we can use microcircuits to so link mechanisms to what is seen here. And the reason is that even though there are some hypotheses and some impl implicated mechanisms, it hasn't been established properly and thoroughly yet. And there is a lot that is not well understood there. So in schizophrenia, it's not the SST so much, it's more of the PV that is implicated, the PV inhibition. Uh, there are some uh, expression studies actually that show reduced PV expression, also reduced N NR2A expression. So essentially indicating that the NMDA input onto PV and the output of the PV are changed. And that where, um, you know, simulating cortical microcircuits can make the link between this and the um, mismatch negativity signals to better understand how each mechanism contributes. Maybe there are subtypes, you know, because um, essentially by doing it very systematically, you can establish the links a little easier than if you work blindly with just a set of a lot of EEG data. You don't know anything about the PV in the patient, right? And then you sort of try to cluster, but based on what, right? So I think it's a good example, and that's something we are working more uh, now in the lab, to use the same approach we use for depression, but to use it in schizophrenia to make those links and maybe help give this complementary information to better stratify uh, subtypes. So to sum up really that in silico EEG biomarkers line of research, um, we can use them, the simulations to link uh, mechanisms, putative mechanisms or ones that have some good evidence to EEG uh, and then better understand the link between EEG and disease mechanism. That can help us improve patient stratification because we can use those metrics, the, whether it's a change in PSD or it's a change in mismatch negativity to better uh, understand subtypes and degrees of severity as linked to underlying uh, mechanisms. And I can add to this also that we can always relate it to brain function because we model that. Uh, when we model, let's say, I'll go back to the schizophrenia, we model the response, the neuronal firing response to no input, to standard input and to deviant input. And then we can relate mechanisms to brain activity, which is really translated to function and to EEG. So it's a really because we can do so much in humans experimentally, it's a very powerful tool to help. And so, as I gave you for the last session, I think a take home message would be those points essentially of what is the utility of those kind of uh, this approach. And lastly, um, I mentioned in briefly, but maybe it's a good time to mention a little more. Um, there are new drugs 
because we have more and more information either from gene expression or some animal models about the involvement of that building blocks of the cortex right in the circuit and cellular level to disease there are more drugs actually that are developed to target that and a tnc bill from kmh has been doing great work to counter this reduction of sst inhibition by boosting it using specific drugs that affect the particular contacts um, the uh, receptors that those connections contact so not one of the things where uh, eg simulations can be very helpful is to provide biomarkers of the efficacy of the drug right to better help monitor it in patients you can see okay you know the psd power is getting back to normal the drug is doing its thing right i mean you want to be able to do it you want you want to be able to do it quantifiably and use those complementary um, measures to help you and uh, not just symptom uh, with symptoms um, uh, scoring but also some uh, a bit more clear-cut um, brain signal information so again if you were to take anything home it's those points really about the applications of those uh, and we are very happy and actively pursuing those applications so the last bit i'll talk about some further topics that i haven't gone into in uh, detail but it's worth going through and mentioning and that can maybe uh, spark some discussions later about everything we've heard today some other aspects so one thing is uh, we looked at the uh, human layer 2 3 models there as i mentioned six layers and uh, they have different roles in processing information i'll just pause actually right now just to see again that I'm not talking to anyone. Let's see, there are two questions. I think I'm going to answer them later. A thumbs up that everything is okay. Excellent. So let's go into the those other topics. So one of the things that are future avenues and we are uh, looking into it is to model more layers to have a more complete representation of that canonical processing circuitry right uh, quickly mentioning layer four is usually receiving inputs from the thalamus at least in sensory areas it sends information to layer two, three, layer five, layer five and layer two, three, to some extent receive inputs as well. It's a very complex processing pathway that is very relevant in, you know, if you want to understand the implications of certain changes, then you, pro you do want to have it all, essentially, this whole circuitry, because it does function fairly coherently together. And on top of it, some, um, gene expression data is can be specific for self or layers we have data that we want to be able to use to be a bit more specific about what is happening there might be changes more in layer two three less in layer five and this data is fast uh, increasing so that's an, another place where modeling more layers can really help us better predict the effect of cellular and circuit changes on brain function and the signals on top of it, uh, and that's a nice experiment by Taufik Valiante from Toronto Western, our collaborator, uh, he's a uh, neurosurgeon that does electrophysiology in um, human tissue. He showed that if you stick an electrode in the deeper layers, layer five, and the superficial layer, layer two, three, you see the oscillations and interestingly the deeper layers precede the superficial layers so they lead them in terms of the oscillations and there is a lot of theory that obviously remains to be characterized about the role of how deeper layers can entrain oscillations in the superficial layers and the important thing to understand the eg signal uh, you is gets a lot of contribution from the superficial parts of the cortex 
but in terms of the dynamics that affect those neuronal parts that then affect the EEG signal, it happens a lot in the deeper layer as well. So once a model has all of those layers, it can better account for the oscillation dynamics that are relevant to uh, health and disease. So another thing, and uh, that relates to some question that we uh, talked about before, Nicely, there are some simpler circuit models from other groups, uh, and I can say a few words about it because especially for the some of you that that might be a bit more relevant to uh, you can the first thing you can do is use fewer uh, cylinders to represent each neuron and that speeds up your uh, simulation. Uh, people have done it in a way that they can preserve a lot of the electrical properties and also the dipole estimation. The reason is also because, first of all, pyramidal neurons are the main contributors to the EEG signal, and it's really their apical dendrites that do that. So as long as you have, uh, you capture enough about the apical dendrites, then your estimate of the EEG is fairly uh, decent. This is an example, uh, a group that developed the HNN tool, human neocortical uh, solver, I think it's called. I don't remember what's the second end there. But uh, they have these simpler models that you can run usually on a laptop. It's faster and you can fit your EEG signal to underlying multi-layer circuits. Uh, that have fewer parameters and it's really useful for exploring what might be happening in the circuit, what are the different regimes. Here they simulate a, a basal input and then an apical input that could underlie phases of a task relevant EEG that they record. It's a very nice group led by uh, Stephanie Jones that developed the tool and does a lot of both experiments and computational models. So this is an example where there, there is a spectrum of models that are all microcircuit models, but have different degree of detail and can maybe run faster and be a bit easier to tackle um, for some people. So definitely worth mentioning. There are even simpler models I'm not going to get into, but point neurons that capture a lot of the FI input output curves that I mentioned, but don't obviously don't capture other things, but capture a few key things about cell types. So I think the take home here is that if you want to simulate circuits, you're not uh, committing to a certain detail or a heaviness of simulation. There are pros and cons uh, to each approach, and it's good to know that there are options. Another thing, another topic, general topic that is worth mentioning is that we looked at one or two disease mechanisms. There are usually multiple. And for example, in depression, there is evidence of uh, synapse, lo synapse loss and cell atrophy, some cell loss as well. Although interestingly, as far as I remember, uh, and that has not changed, um, the original uh, study with the SST specifically shows that there is no reduction in SST number at all. And I don't think that has changed in the past few years since that study. But there are other cells that are lost. So it's, you know, for example, uh, the dendrites get shorter in depression and all in uh, when there is chronic stress and also in aging actually, which is interesting. So those are things that can be modeled as multiple mechanism instead of looking at one mechanism. But it is worth noting that it's not necessary that all subjects have the same, all of those changes together. So I think it's important to proceed with caution when we add more mechanisms, there is definitely an advantage of looking at one, characterizing the specific changes, but it's important also to remember that, you know, we are probably going towards a more multivariate and multi-mechanistic model of uh, disorders, which would probably be more accurate.
Another topic is some other properties of the cells that are relevant to computations, to signals, you know, um, specifically the dendritic properties, which is really why we model the cell in detail. So even though our models do capture some key dendritic integration properties, like the SAG-related currents that I mentioned, there are two main properties. One is sodium related with sodium channels that spike starting at the soma back propagate into the dendrites more actively than uh, if there weren't those channels. And that really couples to, in some pyramidal neurons, two spiking zones, the action potential spiking zone with the calcium spiking zone. And I'm not going to get into it. It's a little like it's, it's uh, re definitely requires a, a few more explanation. But then in a nutshell, it's a powerful property of the, those pyramidal neurons that um, both theory and also studies show plays a role in some interesting computations that those cells are doing in, for example, associating external inputs that will be more in the proximal dendrites and more cortical cortical internal predictions and representations that are more in the distal dendrites. So having those calcium uh, spikes and the whole machinery in the dendrites will be important to understand some uh, cognitive deficits but also, you know, it's very relevant to the SST question because the SST is exactly where they actually inhibit. So that's a, another avenue that we are definitely looking into. And uh, it's worth noting that the data for that in human neurons is unfortunately scarce. And uh, there are some evidence that the back propagation of spikes is as in, you see in rodents, but the calcium spikes are quite different and a little strange, I must admit. Uh, so it's still, it's a little early to commit on modeling some of those things, but that's definitely another thing that I've not talked about too much, but it's uh, there as part of the avenues to pursue. Another very important thing is really uh, the kind of things we model, that this, the functions that the circuit is doing. So I showed you a simple example of a brief stimulus where you can say signal, no signal. You know, another uh, simple example that is a little bit more complex, though, is modeling um, tuning curves of feature parameters like uh, orientation angle. So, for example, this is in a, an older study. We stimulated the neurons in a circuit. This is a small circuit with thalamic input. And then we looked at the recurrent activity in the circuit. Here you see the raster. There is the input here at time zero and then some recurrent activity afterwards. And by changing the amplitudes of the inputs, we can simulate a different incoming uh, edge orientation like in Hubel and Weasel that I mentioned uh, and get a tuning curve. And then that allows us to compare different conditions. For example, you know, reduce SST or a certain knockout of an ion channel. You can compare the average circuit output or tuning uh, to features in control, which is black, uh, to a case where you modulate something uh, to represent an altered mechanism in disease in purple. And that usually uh, will induce changes both in the amplitude of the response of the cortical circuits, but also the tuning selectivity. And we've shown it in other papers, but that's an example of uh, how we can probe the impact of a certain mechanism in even more uh, complicated ways than I've shown you before. And the last bit about that point is that, you know, we want to model more deficits and complex deficits that are uh, relevant to depression. Obviously, it's very challenging. Some of the deficits are more amenable to modeling because we know how to model. For example, there are models of memory based on persistent activity. But in terms of rumination, it becomes more fuzzy. You know, it could also be more of a multi-regional effect, but still it's, we won't, 
one of the lines that we want to look at with those kind of models, because one of the power of them is that uh, we can really translate circuit activity and spiking to function, is to really target functions that are super relevant to a certain condition. But keeping in mind, you know, and that will be the challenging, some of those require more understanding and work. For those that we can model, it's worth also mentioning the deep learning in terms of training networks to do a certain task. Neuronal networks is a really useful tool. And um, even there, there are groups that have been developing deep learning methods uh, in more realistic uh, morphological networks. For example, the group uh, of Blake Richards, uh, He's at McKeel now, and he will actually give a talk later this month, so I encourage people to attend. I mean, they're, they're doing really fascinating work of showing how deep learning can actually occur in the brain. And so, like, that method helps us train our network, our circuit, to do a certain task by finding the right weight. So that will be, I think, a very important line in the next few years to um, explore or probe the effects of cellular and circuit mechanisms that are suggested, let's say, by computational genomics on clinically relevant deficits. Lastly, I think that's probably the last uh, sort of uh, further topic slide that I wanted to uh, talk about is looking at more than one microcircuit or more than one area. For example, in depression, people talk about the increase and the decrease in complementing areas such as the ACC and the PFC. And sometimes in order to actually understand the impact, it's not enough to look at one microcircuit. So I think it's very conceivable to look at two or three, let's say. Obviously, this is not a whole brain um, question at the level of microcircuit. I think that's not tractable right now. But it, I think it will be very interesting to try to model specific areas and model also the interactions they, and the influences they have on one another to better understand disease uh, dynamics and linking the changes in certain components of the circuitry to the overall dynamics that goes beyond that individual area. So I think that will be interesting. And uh, it's actually a good segue because that's probably going to yeah wrap up my, this session. Tomorrow you're obviously going to hear more about whole brain stuff. So this is a good segue and bridge to uh, that part. I think that's all I have to say. Uh, and I will mention before going to questions that the tutorial section at one will be led by Frank. We'll have two parts. Uh, please check up the instructions on GitHub uh, how to get things set up either by using Binder or Docker. I personally found Binder fairly simple. You, you know, you just click it, it sets up quickly and everything runs fairly fine. But uh, do check it out if you prefer Docker as well, then Frank will be available to assist on Gathertown during the break. And with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing. And look at questions. So that's it for the second session. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed also the last bit about some a bit more big questions that, you know, uh, are very relevant to getting the most from a uh, circuit simulation in mental health. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Human neocortical neos uh, neurosolar. Yeah, that's where the N came from. All right, let's look at some questions. Yudajit is asking, where, which electrode position on the scalp do these simulations represent? Is this trend seen across more or less all over? That's a good question. So we mostly look at the prefrontal, but uh, some of the changes, especially the one I talked about in the beginning with the biomarkers uh, that people saw in early depression, is um, actually seen in even in the occip 
occipital lobe. Uh, in terms of locations, that's something that we're getting more and more specific. Uh, we, for example, uh, one of the newer projects, we are simulating specifically the prefrontal uh, cortex with the right proportion of cells and things like that. So uh, to answer also your question, some of the changes are uh, specific to certain areas. Uh, they can be also in multiple locations on the frontal cortex, let's say. Some of them are a bit more all over the place, but I think there is definitely a good specificity. All right, um, another question from you, Dajit. What kind of microcircuit parameters will be targeted to simulate NMDA input versus PV output in a schizophrenia model? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I think I don't need to share my screen for that, but technically, um, we model the cells, the PV interneurons, we model the synapses that they receive from other cells. So the, inhib the excitatory synapses have an NMDA component that we can alter to represent the changes that are happening in uh, schizophrenia. And the PV inhibition on, onto the other cells can be altered to represent the change in PV expression uh, that suggests the change in PV output. So that's how we would do it. And the nice thing is, as I said, all those are already in place. So most of the mechanisms that you see in expression studies are represented in those models. Alex has a question. Reduced SST and morphological atrophy does not seem to be a feature that is unique to depression. These features are also seen in aging. Is this indicative of a comorbidity with increased risk of depression with age, or maybe that, that there are compensatory mechanisms that may be subduing the impact of SST reduction and morphological atrophy in age? Yeah, that's a good question. I think one of the things we should be doing uh, in the next few years is uh, teasing apart the different conditions. I mean, uh, Mikhailov uh, that works with Sri Joy and Dan gave a nice talk about uh, SSD changes in Alzheimer. I hope I'm remembering that correctly, but uh, you know, we need to see, are there different extent of changes? Are there changes in different areas of the brain, in different layers maybe, right? Like there is a few other dimensions that uh, can come on top of just a reduction that can maybe separate those different conditions plus other mechanisms that work in tandem. It's worth mentioning uh, there are groups that did really nice work of probing certain parameters that are suggested, and not just one, several parameters that are suggested by uh, expression studies in schizophrenia, and they show that every mechanism contributes a little, but once you join the effects together, you see a really big effect. So it could be that in order to properly re represent a certain condition, you need just more than just reduced SSD. And the aging uh, component is very interesting. Um, there, there are quite a few similarities, uh, both in atrophy and uh, SSD reduction in between depression and aging. I'm not aware that they necessitate uh, co comorbidity necessarily, but that's something that definitely uh, we need to know more of. Uh, and about. Um, I would assume that, again, like you have a lot of people in aging, there are different deficits, they're not necessarily mood changes per se, right? So I think a lot of it is just similar mechanisms, maybe to different degree that work with other mechanisms to create different effects. So that's exactly where maybe incorporating more mechanisms will help us. Good, so I think we're done with those uh, questions in the box. Uh, technically, we have half an hour or so, so you know we can always take a longer break, which is nice, but uh, let's uh, pause a bit and please, if there is anything you want me to go over again or anything you want to ask, uh, 
there is time for it. In the meanwhile, I'm looking at the poll. We have a lot of neuroscience people and nice representation of uh, clinicians, uh, quite a few engineers and people from psychology as well. So yeah, it's nice to know the crowd we're talking to. Um, I don't know if Frank is on stage, if he can hear us, maybe we can even bring him. Oh, wow, nice. I'm hearing something. Frank? Yeah, so I can uh, I can hear you, but for some reason my, my computer audio isn't working. So I'm using my phone to listen, um, okay. and I'm using my computer to, to speak into the microphone. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. Sounds good. We hear you nicely. Uh, I don't know, you can even put your video maybe. Uh, Frank is doing a very uh, nice work about the EG uh, simulations. He implemented it in LFPi and analyzed a lot. So uh, the tutorial that we're going to hear uh, at one is about simulations, but also a lot about analysis. And that's relevant to even when you just look at data. So it uh, should be very interesting, uh, regardless of where you come from and what kind of stuff you're doing. Uh, yeah. Hello, Frank. So, okay, I see there is a question that popped up here by Samar. When studying a certain disease, for example, Alzheimer, how would you control for other comorbid diseases, e.g. depression, especially in elder adults, right? So one way you can go about it, it's a very good question, by the way, let me just sort of click on start answering it. One way you would go about it is that you uh, cluster your data to different sets. For example, uh, we have of the tissue we have from uh, Toronto Western Hospital has some patients that are actually also diagnosed with depression. So let's say you didn't want to um, confound your data with uh, depression changes. You would just select the tissue samples and the data that doesn't have that and then you can get some conclusions there. The nice thing is that you can also compare, you can analyze the data that has both, you know, maybe elderly people with depression or Alzheimer and depression, and then you can make comparisons. So that's how you would do that. You would pretty much have to actively separate your data and not just pull it all together. We have not done that. So like our neurons are from, they're not uh, separated into really those kind of parameters. Although I mentioned that we are modeling in another project uh, young and old human neurons and therefore microcircuits, and there we specifically separated the pyramidal neuron data that we had to less than 50 years of age and more than 50 years of age, and that really leads to some interesting discoveries and implications. So yeah, I mean, that's how you would do it, and it would really make for very interesting uh, projects. Uh, obviously, usually you don't have enough data. I mean, having just like 30 cells in general is pretty exciting. So separating it into groups will be a bit challenging, but as more and more data becomes available, then this is the way to go. And I'll mention again, unless it was, you know, I'm sure it was clear from yesterday, but I can emphasize that the way we work with the uh, Shri Joy Tripathy's uh, group is exactly uh, capitalizing on their ability to curate the data and also segregate it and analyze it into those demographical uh, and you know cellular changes, and then we can better inform our model. So, on top of just suggesting mechanisms, um, there is a lot of data curation that happens before we start modeling that uh, Shri Joy's group is doing. So um, we, we've uh, done it quite a lot actually and, and benefited from it. Uh, yeah, 
uh, done as well obviously looks more at population level but at some point those uh, abilities of that group will also really greatly enhance the quality of our models uh, we've for now have been humbly at the level of uh, cellular uh, more but uh, yeah as we uh, become better and better able to connect the different facets of a disorder to function to any other kind of aspects all those data analysis and segregation methods will play a huge role in doing things right We'll wait a few more minutes. Uh, if we do finish early, then we might use this time. You know, people could uh, connect with Frank in Gathertown. Uh, as I said, it's fairly simple this year. Last year we had an LFPi Docker. So <laughs> we actually simulated the neurons and stuff. This is a very heavy thing, but uh, nowadays it's a bit more uh, on the Python side, more of the analysis. So I think in terms of getting set up for the tutorial, it's going to be easier uh, this uh, year, but uh, yeah, uh, I'll wait two more minutes for questions. Feel, uh, please feel free, and if there would be none, then we might uh, finish in two minutes, and you can set up. I can also maybe mention Kent, Yao, and Alex Gwet McWright have been uh, the people leading the circuit development. And you know, if you see them, they might be in the crowd, so feel free to chat with them. They might be in Gather Town if you have questions about some of the models. Frank helped us implement that circuit in LFPi and then pushed nicely forward into simulating the EEG. So, any questions about that? details of how do you do this PSD and all of those decisions and all of that uh, Frank can help you regardless of the tutorial so you know feel free to uh, approach us uh, there is slack there is gather town and yeah we're happy to help and provide any further information the questions have been great and one last chance for a round of questions one or more if you want uh, before we adjourn uh, I don't know Erin or anyone if you want to also send a message about anything I see that you link them to the code and the gather town please uh, fill the uh, poll after the survey to let us know how it went how we can improve uh, I hope the pace was okay, like uh, I think we had a good level of detail. Obviously there is a limit to how much one can delve in, in such a session. But uh, I hope you got a good taste. And with that, I will end the session in a moment. Uh, have the, you got yourself a nice free 25 extra minute of a break. You can definitely use it. We'll be in Gather Town. Uh, so if you need any assistance, get ready for the uh, tutorial. And yeah, should be fun. So take care, been a pleasure. Nice questions and see you later. Bye.